forward with part two of four revival principles that we started last week, but I thank God for the revival spirit and the revival attitude, the revival focus that God has been just challenging us with, and, and sometimes you save this kind of teaching for the fall, because that's when everybody gets fired up, but I'm grateful for the reception that we feel in the Holy Ghost and for the direction that we have that God is giving right now, and I just... I have this idea that the, the eminence of that revival is so real, that it's, it's such a reality that's going to come, that we don't want to waste time, we don't want to waste weeks, we don't want to waste months, but we want to take advantage of what God is doing in our world right now, and we don't want to miss a moment. And part of this is teaching we, to be able to identify what an end-time revival looks like, but it's also about being able to walk in that attitude and mentality and focus that brings an end-time revival. I, I just got to tell you, I'm so grateful to be a part of a church that has a desire. There's, there's hungering. I'm grateful for everything that we've got. I'm so thankful for what we have in our services and the people that are part of our church family, but I just... I just sense that you're not satisfied yet, that until, until God sends an outpouring, we're not satisfied, and until these seats are filled to overflowing, and it not just in one service, in multiple services, we're not satisfied. We're hungry for more. We're, we're desiring more, and God said there is more, so until we see more, we're not satisfied until we see that happen. I believe that, and, and we're so very grateful for <clears throat> that reciprocate sense that we have in the Holy Ghost, that it's not just a directive that's thrown out there in the midst of midair and, and left there until maybe somebody grabs it, but there is this, it almost feels like a dialogue. There's just a response in the Holy Ghost for what we believe God is going to do. Someone say amen. 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 Brother Calhoun, it's so good to have you in church with us tonight. I know that your flight to Europe was canceled, I believe. So we got one more service at CCC, but we're sending you an authority, and we're praying that God will use you greatly in the next season of harvest over there. Someone say amen. 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 Uh, we are believing that God is going to send an end time revival. Uh, we quoted Joel chapter 2. Just allow me a few minutes to, to do a quick review. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. It's a major prophecy from a minor prophet. It's a yet to be seen revival. It's a declaration, but yet it stirs something in our spirit for more. There's a desire. It's multicultural. It's multi-generational. It has no socioeconomic preferences. It's just an end time revival prophecy that's given to us in the word because God's got revival waiting for us. It's going to happen. Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward. I wonder if we could read that together. It shall come to pass afterward. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Next verse. And also upon servants and handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. The Bible tells us that it would come afterward. After what? So if we only knew when, but we are given some idea through scripture about what's going to happen before we see this end time revival. There's four indicators and I wrote them out for you. All those people that take great notes, you, you'll thank me for this. But number one, there's a season out, of outpouring that's going to happen. Someone say outpouring. In verse 23, we're given that, that verse. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you. Someone say, for me. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That there's going to be an outpouring of the former and the latter rain together. Number two, there's a season of harvest. That the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine. There's a, a season of restoration. Someone say restoration. He said, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. All different levels of devastation. But God said he would restore. And uh, that kind of hitched up on us in the Holy Ghost last week because we all have people that we know that we are desiring for God to bring restoration to. There are people in our families. There are people that were a part of our church family, but somewhere along the way they, they, uh, they backslid or they got lost. And, and somewhere along the line they stopped attending. But we are believing that whatever we've lost, that God will restore. 
that God is going to bring it back. Whatever the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, whatever we've lost, God said, I will restore. How many believe that God can? I, I, I don't want to take a lot of time because I know we got more notes to get through tonight. But, but would someone just lift a hand and say, God, would you do that work of restoration? If you've got an unsaved loved one, would someone just say, God, do that work of restoration? I, I only have to look around the room. I can't even get through a section before I start thinking of names that some people right now are lifting up to the Lord. We're believing that God is going to restore. Lord, we stand on that promise tonight. You will restore. God is if you promised it in the natural, how much more concerned are you of souls than you are of wheat fields and, and harvest fields? God, that harvest of end time that you promised you would restore. God, let it be. God, let it be a promise that we stand on. Let it be a promise that we walk into. Bring restoration today, God, we pray. I feel a little help from the Holy Ghost right now. Someone, you need to see someone in your mind coming back to an altar. You need to see somebody coming through the back doors. You need to see somebody being refilled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost because our God is a God that restores today. Hallelujah. In our own lives, God is a restorer. He will restore. I, I don't know what the enemy stole, but God said, I'll restore. I don't know what it is that the devil got away with, or it seems like he has up until now. But here's what I know. God will restore at some point in your life. He's going to tell you, just like he did David, go and recover all. If you go after it, I'm going to release it. I'm going to yield it. I'm going to turn it around. It's all going to come back. Whatever it is that went out the door, God said, it's coming back in the door. It may, it may be a little while, but it's going to come back pressed down shaken together and running over I believe that God isn't finished he is going to restore he's going to restore and and there's a season of certainty that's coming we aren't going to question and we aren't going to doubt we aren't going to wonder about if God will we are going to have a confidence that God is at work we are going to be able to declare like Peter did this is that this is that that was prophesied. If Peter could stand and say, this is what Joel was preaching about, then I believe that one day we're going to be able to stand in this pulpit and we're going to be able to preach to a congregation that has filled this room and say, let me just tell you what's happened. This is that that was prophesied by the prophet Joel in the last days. Saith God, I will, I will, I shall pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Sons, daughters, come on. No limitation, no restriction in in the last days I will and we're going to have a certainty that we have walked into a place of revival then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God someone say do it God do it God we're going to have a season of certainty we're we're not going to be wondering we're not going to be questioning we're not going to be be just kind of it's just going to be engagement we know God you're doing what you promised I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to the day when we aren't wondering, I, I wonder if it's going to happen. It's just going to be something that God begins to do. No man is going to take credit for it. Nobody, nobody's going to be able to say, well, this is because of that. It's just because we were faithful. It's just because through the years, seed has been deposited in the soil. It's just because prayers have been prayed. It's just because the word has been preached and it will not return void. The seed will spring up out of the soil. There's not going to be a question. It's going to be an absolute certainty God this is you at work this is what you have promised <laughs> I'm believing it's gonna happen I feel that in the room don't you feel that faith rising but right now we're still waiting we're waiting for it and the Acts 2 church waited for it just like we did. So our first point last week for revival principles is wait, but don't wander. Don't wander through the land. It alarms me that Israel could come to, right to the border of the promised land, but then miss out because she decided that she would prefer to wander than walk into the promise that God had for her. Waiting, waiting. Sometimes we're waiting and 
And uh, we're just asking and we're, we're faithfully. But here's what we know. If we wait on God, our strength will be renewed. That's the promise. That if we wait, our strength, God will renew our strength and we'll mount up with wings as eagles. We'll run and not be weary. We'll walk and not faint. Isaiah 40 verse 29, if you backed it up just a little bit, he said that he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He receives strength. He, he increases strength. We get to receive the strength that God has available if we're willing to wait. To them that have no might, he increases strength. Waiting on God is engaging. It's active. It's participating it's yearning it's desiring waiting just isn't we talked about the waiting room the dentist waiting room someone sent me a picture of my dentist waiting room this week it was not me I will leave that person nameless is this the waiting room they said <clears throat> but here's what we know that that times of refreshing shall come but we are willing to wait. Don't wander in the waiting. Be intentional. Here, here's, here's our benefit that we're, when we're in that season of waiting, we're not just wandering about life. Is that we're very intentional because if you believe that God is going to send a revival, then we begin planning for it. We begin preparing for it. We begin asking uh, for ways that we can be involved and, and ways that we can, we can kind of create an environment that... that that God can use to, to minister to people. It's still people. We're still going to be working with real people with real hurts and real hang-ups and real trouble. But if we prepare in this season of waiting, when those people come through the doors, we're not all going to be looking at one another and saying, well, what do we do now? What are we going to do now? That we are, we are engaged now saying, well, what would we do if we had 50 new people in, Sunday, in one Sunday school class? What would we do if we, if we had a couple, couple hundred more children in our, our children's ministry department? What, what are we going to do when, when our youth ministry just balloons and fills the chapel? What, what's our next step? And we, we need people, and we need, we need, look, we've got all kinds of property. There's been a couple of people kind of asking about the property, and, and we just kind of said, right, right now, anything near the church, we aren't really interested in selling <laughs> Some people say, sell, sell, sell. So we don't know. We don't know why God put that in our hands yet. It may be that we need. There it is. That's faith reaching right there. So while we're waiting, we're not just wandering. We're being intentional. We're. Our, our staff meetings are exciting. They're not just boring. We're talking about what if, what can we do, what, what should we do, what should we be organizing, how, how can we be planning. That, that's, it's exciting working around here. Point number two, B, A, B. Uh, <clears throat> connecting, not competing. It's about us working together. I, I, I don't see any division in Joel chapter 2. No division of age and no division uh, it's men and women. It's, it's no division of socioeconomic class. No matter what job or what your income is, people are working together. It's all everybody pulling together. It's, it's not competition. It's not envy. It's not jealousy. It's people working together. Someone say, I need you. Look at your neighbor say, I need you. It's about connecting and not competing and and the bible's emphatic about what happens when we begin to work together we all have skills that others don't have and so god expects us to work someone say together you could even spell it wrong in your notes if you want t-w-o gather together we need to work together and jesus just didn't send people out all by themselves he sent them out two by two that disciples were, were to join together. And, and, and that just kind of voids the idea about competition. It's about, it's about working with one another. And the disciples could have had all, all kinds of reasons to, to compete with one another, but they, they didn't. They, well, initially they did, but in the New Testament church, we don't see that. That the responsibility laid on them, and they, they worked together. It's about connecting and not competing. It's about linking arm in arm. And we talked about the Greek word over a hundred times. Alelon. It means one together, one another, each 
other mutually, reciprocally. It talks about how we are, <clears throat> it commands us, teaching us how to relate to one another, working together. Just look at your neighbor on the other side one more time and say, I need you. And a re revival church in this this, uh, this will lean into the next point a little bit, but a revival church is about relationships. A revival church requires that we have one another working together. He sent them two and two before his face in every city. And um, our world is looking for true, authentic, genuine relationships. And it means sometimes that, that we've got to break away from the comfort zone that we are connected to. So we can allow someone else to connect to us. I didn't expect a huge amen on that. Thank you. And it comes down to how we live this life that God has called us to live. We need to be intentional about connecting with guests. We need to be intentional about um, and, and I love, I love the fellowship. I love that people are, are here in service after church is done for anywhere up to an hour. Sometimes I don't always like that if I'm the last to leave, but, but it's, it's wonderful when, <clears throat> when the church is fellowshipping and connecting. But could I just encourage you to do one thing? Invite somebody else that you see around the circle. Invite someone into the sphere of influence that you're connecting with. Connect beyond what you already know to be a great connection because God intends for our church to grow. It's about, it's about a lifestyle that knows that more people are going to come. That this church is going to grow and it's going to require us all working together. Because people need people. We need one another. We want revival. We want the fire to fall and I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost down with fire. But he also baptizes us with a love for one another. And even the another that you don't know yet. And it's hard. It's hard. It's hard even for extroverts to kind of break out and bring people around the table or, or connect with people. And that's why we have a connect night. A connect night is so that we can, wait for it, connect. I know. You got to be smart to get through Bible study with us. <laughs> but connecting with one another. You know, God is looking for someone that's willing to go into the highway and the byways. But he's also waiting for someone to accept, accept the person that's coming from there. Some different folks in the highways and the byways. But God has a place for each one of them. Do we have room in our lives for new connections? Or are we jammed with events, plans, schedules until there's literally no margin? See, that's, that's really what we're talking about, connecting and not competing. And it leans into the next point, part C, is living and not dying. We, <clears throat> we, um, we've used those, that phrase often, God, I'm willing to give my life for you. And, and I've sung the song with all of you. Lord, I'm available to you. And sometimes we're, we're so willing, you know, we're, we got to be willing to give our lives for Christ. And, and we've seen all the end time videos about how the end of time may come. Well, maybe the young people haven't, but anyone my age and up has. A thief in the night. And we've got to be willing. I've, I've <laughs> looked that up on YouTube. It's kind of surreal. I, I didn't stay. In, I remember when they showed it in our church, and I told mom and dad, I was like, I, it's too scary for me. I'm going out in the entryway. <clears throat> and uh, anyhow, but the idea that someday we may have to die for the cause of Christ and that we may become martyrs 
and that whole idea. And, and that becomes the scope of, of some time that we are willing, we are willing to die for Christ. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to die. But, but I think part of the question of right now is are we willing to live for Christ? Are we willing for our lives to be impacted and our, our dreams and our ambitions, our goals? Are, are we willing, you know, we, we've got this quadrant of life and, and we all do, Jack Lehman included. I'll put my name over this one, but we've got mine and, and then we've got ours and we've got, we've got yours and then we've got God's. We've got this quadrant that we live life in and, and we spend some time up here in mine and, and that's kind of selfish, but we all do it. We just live for ourselves and, and then we've got this this quadrant of life that that you know it's it's not mine it's ours but it's self-serving it's it's my family and my house and my ambitions and my dreams and my goals and and so we've got self-serving ideas here we got selfishness and self-service and and then but then we've got this this part about yours where where we have to start looking beyond ours and beyond mine to a world beyond me and it's about reaching out and it's about connecting with someone beyond my influence or beyond where I've been before. It's selfless out there. It's selfless. And then there's God's. And God's is when our life becomes so filled with worship that we are focused completely on him. We all have that, that quadrant in our life that, that we live life through. But God is calling us, God is calling us to sacrifice and discipleship and to live for him not just die for him if you'll notice that that wasn't you know philippians that's what he said for me to live is christ and to die is gain or philemon romans 1 uh, romans 14 8 it says for whether we live we live unto the lord and whether we die we die to the lord whether we live there unto or die we are the lord's so that's what we gotta we sometimes we get focused on and whether we die we die to the lord but god has said whether we live we live unto the lord in other words, there's this whole element that we can't miss. Yes, I'm willing to die for the cause of Christ. But are we willing to live for the cause of Christ? Because sometimes it is in our death that God is looking for to give him glory. God is looking for our life to give him glory. It's how we live. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Just take a minute and see that with me. Let that burn into, for whether we live, God, God leaves us alive so we can live unto the Lord. That our lives become this channel, this vessel that God uses to accomplish his purpose. Uh, not just willing to die, but, but I've got to be willing to live for God. Pastor Matt preached about it just past, this past Sunday and I taught about it a few weeks ago, but it's about whose kingdom are we building? It's, it's not about our kingdom. Thy kingdom come. We spend our time building something. We are going to build. We are going to maintain, but, but we have to choose for his kingdom to be built, living, not dying. God isn't asking that we die from. God is asking that we live for him. And, 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 and if we ever stop to ponder the point what would life look like if we lived for him? I mean, him alone. And as I was thinking through that question today, I began to ask myself and framed the question like this. Uh, what if we lived like we knew that we were dying? If we knew that this week was our last week, how, how would we live? Or if we knew that the month of, of, of August was the last month that we would that we would have, how would we live? What, what would we do? What, what would we reach for? What would we, who would we preach to? What conversations would, would have to clear the air that, that we've kind of had some ought with somebody? And, and what kind of forgiveness would we seek? What kind, of, what kind of content would we have in our life? What would we do if we knew that this was the last week that I had to live, or this was the last month, or this is the last year? How, how would I live? How would I live unto the Lord if this was my last month? If I knew that, that eternity was on the other side of just next week or next month or, or even next year, what, what kind of intentions would I put in place and what kind of actions would I pursue because I want to live a life that God is pleased with. 
I want to live a life that impacts the world. I, I want to live a life that opens the door for revival to come. I, I want to live. I don't, uh, you know, if, we, if we've got to die for the cause of Christ, so be it. I, but right now, I, I, I'm asking if there's a church that's willing to live for the cause of Christ. Is there a church that's willing to say, I, I'll put my, my life on the line. I'm, I'm willing to give, and I'm willing to preach. I'm willing to teach, and, and I'm willing. I'm willing to give for the cause of Christ. And finally, our, our last point tonight is actually two merged into one. It's prayer and the word. I know that that's two principles, but they're so intrinsically connected that they function as one. The word, the word is that the message of salvation, I, we, can't, we, we can't even take the last hour of Bible study. I'm just teasing. We can't, we can't even take the rest of the night to try and unpack the impact of the word in our lives. But if I were, if I were to summarize and say that the word is, is that message of salvation, it's, it's the story of restoration that God begins from the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden until it's from the, the tree of life in the garden to the tree of life in eternity. And somewhere in between there, we find ourselves on this promise that God has for us. It's, it's the story. That's the word. And the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And, and the word becomes the sacrifice. And the blood that we sang about flows for the remission of sins. And it powers the body of Christ. And it opens the door of salvation. And, and, and we walk into that today. The word. We walk in the truth of the word. And, and, and so that truth is placed with great responsibility into our hands. Along with prayer. We have the responsibility of prayer. And so we have these two powerhouses placed in our hands. And God says this is to change the world that you live in. That the power of the word and the power of prayer are given to the New Testament church. And yes, it's to have great services. And yes, it's so that we are challenged on a daily basis. But, but the emphasis of the prayer of prayer and the word wasn't just to bolster the existing church. It wasn't just so that the 12 disciples could have a soft place to land after the crucifixion of Christ. The, the, the word and prayer were given because there was a world that needed to be reached. And so God expects for, for this and we're talking about revival. And so the revival that we're talking about, the word, and, and I'm grateful for the word that is preached from this pulpit. And I'm grateful for the word that goes with missionaries on the foreign field. And I'm grateful for the word that's released through YouTube. Or I'm grateful for how the word is preached. I, I'm thankful for all that. But, but it isn't just these avenues that, we are, that sometimes we relegate the word to that God is going to use. God needs all kinds of people to get the word and deliver it. In Acts chapter 6, we, we see a little bit of the conflict because we have Acts 2 and the Holy Ghost is poured out and, and the miraculous occurs and the disciples start to walk in this promise and thousands are added to the church and they're, they're wrestling with the responsibility of what God has just done. They're wrestling with that and, and then <clears throat> so they, they start to divide the tasks but, but it's all landing on the lap of the disciples and in Acts chapter Six, it says that we're, we, you know, we're, we're not meant to wait on tables, they said, but, but we will give ourselves continually to, the, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas. And sorry, guys, if I crucified your names. And so we have... These seven men in, in Acts 6 that are given the responsibility of assisting the disciples. The Bible says about waiting on tables. And I thought, you know, I'll dig out in the, the Greek and see what that, that says. And it basically says just what it says. Waiting tables. And of course, it was a picture of many of the responsibilities and, and the people that needed to be visited. And the responsibilities that was in the in the hands of the church for the widows and, and people that felt like maybe some were being uh, overlooked. And, and so they extended the responsibility to 
just the few of ministry. And, and I'm, I'm not here to, to say I'm going to hole up in the office and you all can do the work. That's not what we're talking about. We have a, a great staff and we, we don't have, we, we have a mentality where we all work together when we all pull together. I'm, I'm thankful for that. So that's not what I'm, I'm not here to oppose that. I'm not here to pr promote it. I, I'm just saying that, that we all work together around here. And, and this responsibility didn't just stay. They could have said, well, you're, you guys are the disciples. You, you do it. You, you do the job. But I'm, I'm grateful for every person that comes along and says, let us help with the responsibility of revival. And I do have a point to make in just a moment. But, but when the word and the prayer becomes our priority, read what happens. When they laid hands on them and they prayed, the Bible says in verse 7, that the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. Does that sound like revival? That it multiplied greatly. That's what we're hungering for. But the picture in Acts 6 is that we need to push the responsibility out into the pew. The pulpit can be our biggest enemy sometimes. Because we, believe me, I would love for it to happen just from here. And I'm not even saying I need to be the guy preaching it. But if that, if that happened and and we just preach from here. And I, 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 I'm grateful for the Charles Spurgeons in the past and the preachers that were, were eloquent and delivered the word so powerfully. I'm grateful for Pastor Woodward. I'm grateful for the teaching and the preaching that, that we hear here. And I, I'm grateful for all that. And we, we're thankful for it. I love church. I, I love a, a good message that gets me up off my seat and gets me in the aisle. And I like pounding on the altar. Come on. Preach it! Going over shine in their shoes. I love it. Man, I, I was watching the podcast, Pastor Matt, of Joel Urshan and your, your father. And, and what a, man, it was just like so awesome hearing him talk about how from the time that he was 10 years old, he and his brother encountered some friends that wanted to know more about doctrine. Now, how many have watched that podcast? Yeah, it's not a, not a criticism if you haven't. I didn't get to it till today. So, um, but if if you have a minute just to go through that, and and I love Brother Urson's preaching, and I I love pastors preaching, and, and and you you realize that he's been doing this for so long since he was ten years old, and he would go along with his dad, and his dad would be preaching meeting somewhere, and he'd go and preach for the youth, and he said, "I'll be honest, it wasn't all that great," and then it got better. And then we get to hear him at, at our youth convention, and he's just powerfully delivered the word, and it's just incredible. And I, I love church like that. I love it. I think, it, I think it's exciting. I, I'm never taking anything away from the power of the preached word, and I, I'm not taking anything away from what happens on, in, on this platform or is preached from this pulpit. I'm thankful to God for the ministry that we get to hear. All right, go ahead. We can, we can clap. <clears throat> I'm, I'm thankful to God for that. But the increase of the word, it said it increased. There's a dramatic increase. And it wasn't because the disciples filled their calendar with more preaching engagements and events. Let me tell you what happened. The people that were commissioned to be a part of this end time revival, of, of that time revival, began preaching. That's why Stephen was one of those seven that were, were given the obligation of waiting tables. But guess where we find Stephen next? He's preaching himself into martyrdom. He's preaching so hard, so straight. He's laying it out there for everybody to hear. And he's, wait, Stephen, you're supposed to be at the diplomat waiting tables. 
And he's not. He's preaching. The, I, I, I've just got in my mind this idea that, that the ministry of the word was so, such a great responsibility that even the, everybody that signed up to be a part and those that were commissioned to just kind of do tasks and responsibilities all of a sudden said, you know what? I can deliver the mail. I can, I can, I can get engaged in this. I can preach that message. I, I know what the new birth is all about. I, I know about that. And so Stephen's willing not just to do his responsibility of waiting tables, but he's willing to step out and become a preacher that the apostolic church needed then and there to bring revival to their then known world I'm just wondering is there a Stephen in the room somewhere that says I'll be a part of what God is going to do I, I'll, be, I'll be someone that's willing to engage the world with the word Amen. the word the increase of the word brings great multiplication it brings someone shout revival revival, revival. I I am so thankful for our church and thank you for your giving and, and where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't know of another church where the per capita giving is greater than CCC. I, I don't know about it. And people marvel because of your generosity and people marvel because of your sacrifice. And, and so none of this is a criticism of that, but, but I'm, I, I believe that in the Holy Ghost, God is, is challenging us to give more in the area of living. Thank you for your giving, but God's saying, I'm challenging you to the next level of living. Living. Our church operates on your giving, and we're, we're just so very close to paying off the final part of our, our building project, and it, it would be finished if it hadn't been for the, we're getting some new furniture for the foyer. So... Some of that's in the office wing, and some of it's piled up out here, and some, some of the couches are there. It's, it's coming. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Give your neighbor a high five. Thank you. But <clears throat> That was a pretty quiet high five. <laughs> a lot of you high five like me. <laughs> the economy of, of dollars and cents can, can construct. And your giving on that level can help us create a space and, and all of that. But the giving of living, <laughs> when we begin to live the word that God has called us to live and preach, it opens the door to expand the church in so many other ways. We can come back to the music tonight. It's, it's completely natural for all of us to assume that the ministry of the word was different than waiting tables. But... <clears throat> That distinction is removed with the life of Stephen and Philip and people that just refused to only do a limited responsibility. And I've got to believe that the modern day church moves in that realm by the way of personal home Bible studies. See, I knew he was going to get on that. Because it's, it's Bible studies, it's, it's, it's the power of connection, it's Bible studies that are, are one of the tools I believe that God is going to use to expand our church in a way that we have never seen before. Amen. Thank you, Sam. It's, it's very interesting to me that much of the new business in dining out is actually eating in. Skip the dishes. Anybody heard of that? What are the other ones? Yeah, somebody said, praise the Lord. Hmm? Uber Eats. DoorDash. I can't. There may be more. We don't know. I think you got it. You did better than me. But I read a little article that said that the restaurant industry has seen a dramatic rise in off-premise sales takeout and delivery were gaining popularity even before coronavirus and pandemic struck the world in 2020, but the pandemic related closures only accelerated consumer trends toward ordering food via mobile app and picking it up curbside or having it delivered rather than being in a restaurant dining room. Dine-in's alive and it's well, but there's a healthy number of con consumers going out for a dining experience on a regular basis. However, reports covering the state of the restaurant industry note that the majority of the growth lies in off-premise sales. If the restaurant industry could realize that for them, 
to grow. They, they have to move the food out of the environment where we are so traditionally used to seeing it. Church, I'm wondering if we could just kind of take a little lesson from the marketplace and say, you know, what would happen if we took the word and we got it in the hands of hundreds of people and moved it out of the four walls into coffee shops and into living rooms? What would happen? What would happen if we, if we were willing to, to set aside? Here, here's the challenge. You know so much word that you don't even realize that you know. I believe that the world's best Bible study teachers have yet to crack, crack open the search for truth Bible study church. I believe that the best Bible study teachers and the, the greatest level of opportunity is, is right there. And, and guess what? The prayer, that prayer in the word isn't limited to Sunday. <laughs> it's not limited to Wednesday. It's not limited to special events and special weekends, but, but that the word all of a sudden, we have somebody teaching a Bible study on Monday evening, or we, and we do right now. We, we've got somebody teaching a Bible study on Tuesday evening, and, and we do right now. And we've got somebody teaching Bible study here, maybe on Wednesday, but we've got, we've got Bible studies that are going on all week long. But I'm just engaging CCC that, that our world needs what you've got. And that the prayer and the word, when you put a little bit of prayer, and, and, and I, I, I know that we're kind of in the whole, we were talking about it and staff meeting some, and, and Brandon Pike, he, we were talking about another, something else. He said, let me, let me take your attention to First Apostolic Church of Maryville, and, and we love their model, and we love uh, what they've done as far as growing a church in a community. And I was watching through that yesterday, and I began to, it's FAC culture, First Apostolic Church of Maryville culture, church culture, and I was just listening to them dialogue and talk about what they do together, but, but without exception, before the end of the first session, they got to Bible studies. And the lead pastor, he, he kind of stopped up and he said, can I, just, can I just go back to Bible studies for a minute? Because he knows that the growth of their church, a great, fantastic, powerful large church the benefit that they can see is that people begin to teach home bible studies that 90 percent of teaching the bible study he said the pastor said this he said brother carpenter he said 90 percent of teaching a bible study is building relationship with the one that you're teaching he said let, let me just break it down for you he said I, I have one goal he said to get them baptized in jesus name and filled with the holy ghost and seeing the revelation of the oneness of god he said it's 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 so powerful, but he said the, the next responsibility, the, great, the next great responsibility is building relationship. And to build relationship. And, and maybe you want to even start with your children. Let's start right there and start. Our first Bible study could be with our kids. And it, it's part of our home Bible study is in our own home. But, but then we're determined that we're going to kind of reach out. I was encouraged when Joel Urshan and his brother taught a Bible study to their neighborhood when they were 10 and 13 years of age. And we see the powerful preacher in the pulpit, but we didn't see this 10-year-old kid that kind of stepped out and said, all right, here we go. He said, we just kind of went off on our own. We got in, in prayer and we got studying the Word. And then we come back together in dialogue about what we'd found in the Word of God to talk to our friends about salvation. One goal. One goal is to get them baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and seeing the revelation of the oneness of God. But then he didn't stop there. He said, it's a win-win. Because what we, what we fail to realize is that it isn't just this, this effort extending. It's something that happens. It's, it's a dialogue that occurs. It comes back and forth. And he said, it's a win-win. He said, because in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, he said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, he said, in preaching and teaching, he said, In doing this, thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. He said, there's something that powerful that happens that when you begin to dialogue and preach and teach the Word of God, not only are you creating a salvation opportunity for whoever you're teaching, he said, that teaching just somehow ends up saving you. You want salvation security? Begin teaching the Word of God. Sharing it with someone that needs it. The process of teaching the word isn't static, it's dynamic, it's ebb and flow. It's powerful. 
Ephesians 5, 26, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. By the water, sorry, by the washing of water by the word. There's power in the word of God. In Psalms chapter 126, he can stand together with me tonight. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The opportunity for great end time harvest and revival is standing right in front of the seat you sat in through the lesson tonight. God wants to use you for end time revival. I wonder if you close your eyes. I'm just going to, one more time, read Joel chapter 228. And I'm praying that God will give you a vision because that's when one of the promises of this scripture. I, I'm standing on it tonight. I'm praying that God will give somebody a dream. I'm praying that God will let a prophetic utterance come into someone's spirit that they can't be satisfied until it's released. I'm praying that his spirit will be poured out. I wonder if you would just, just begin to open your life and open your mind and open your heart. God, your word says this, it shall come to pass afterward. God, that you would pour your spirit out upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out of my spirit. God, our prayer tonight in this lesson that we've been teaching, just four principles, and God, there's so many more than just four. But God, I pray that you would allow us to integrate, God, to move these ideas beyond just the page into our lifestyle, God, into our activity, that we would extend and open our arms and welcome to those that are around us, I pray. God, that you would let your presence begin to move in a powerful way. God, we are hungry for end time revival. God, we're saying here's a vessel, here's a vehicle, God, here's a church that you can use in this end time. God, see our heart. God, I pray that you would allow us to be your voice. Let us be, God, your light. Let us be, God, the ones that you would use in the last days. God, we ask for it. God, we petition it. We make it a part of our daily prayer. God, we make it a part of our requests. God, with everything else that we're asking you for, we're praying, Jesus, would you pour your spirit out? God, we're asking, let revival fire burn. God, let it burn in our lives. God, would you open the door? Let the threshing floor be filled with wheat. God, I, I pray for the fields that are already white under harvest. God, don't let this just be part of the landscape that we go by every single day. But God, would you begin to allow us to see the harvest that is before us. God, the harvest that is awaiting. The harvest, Jesus, let it challenge us. God, let it call our name. Let it invite us into the harvest field. Let it become, God, a part of our daily activity. Let it be, God. Let it be, we pray, in your precious name. Would you lay your hands on your neighbor for a moment? We're finished the lesson, but I'm praying that God would allow burden to be released. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed. God, I pray right now, God, would you release burden in this room? God, let it be a burden for our community. Let it be a burden, God, for our city. Let it be a burden for our province. We're asking tonight, God, God, move us. Move us, God. If you have to move us emotionally, he that goeth forth weeping, God, would you open the door of our heart? Would you, God, would you reach in and begin to lay a, lay a soul on our spirit? God, lay somebody's life before us, I pray. Give us a name. God, give us a vision, we pray. God, let us see. God, the people that we walk by every day, let us, God, give us a burden for the people that we are in contact with. Give us a burden, God. Give us an end time, apostolic 
burden for revival. God, let it come in prayer. God, let it come in that dis discipline of prayer. Let it become a part of our daily routine when, God, you allow us to see the harvest field. God, we pray. God, we pray that you would bless us in this end time. God, it's not all doom and gloom. God, there's prophetic promise that's yet to be released. The world can talk about everything wrong, but God, I pray that we are able to let them know there's something right that's going to happen. Lord, send a revival. God, send a revival, but let it start in me. God, let it start in me. Let it start in me, I pray. Oh, come on. Would you just make that prayer more than, more than the right prayer to pray? Would you make it your prayer for a moment? I'm wondering tonight, I'm wondering tonight, I wonder if we could do the old every head bow and every eye closed. I'm wondering tonight if there are people here in the room that, that you'd be willing to say, you're, you're not saying that you know how to teach a Bible, Bible study yet. You're not saying that you know how to, but I'm wondering if there's anybody that would just raise your hand and say, I'd be willing to. I'd be willing to. I wish you could see what I see. I, I love what I see. I'd be willing to. I'd be willing to be a part of that end time revival. I thank you for that. You can go ahead. Put your hand down. We're going to be very intentional about putting uh, Bible studies available, make them available for you. And, and if we have an idea about people that are willing, we'll, we'll be sure that we're prepared before that end time harvest comes and we'll have the opportunity to have a whole army of people ready to teach how many will continue in prayer for revival thank you we love you God I pray tonight as this marvelous incredible group of people prepare to leave I thank you for every person with us online tonight God I pray wherever they are I pray that you would birth a revival somewhere God let it begin let it occur but God let it begin in our life let it begin with the power of the word the power of prayer God let it begin with connecting with one another making sure God that we're not doing this alone but that we're joining with someone that shares this like precious faith with us God I, I pray tonight God that you would allow us to live for you God that we would serve you in every area of our lives we give you great praise because you are indeed a great God. We love you tonight. God, go with every person when they leave this room. Place anointing on them. God, place a burden for ministry in them. God, challenge us. Wake us up in the middle of the night. Call us, God, I pray. In your precious name we ask. Someone shout amen.